welcome. Thank you for joining us on this LAN portal webinar. I'm just going to give us a few moments as uh, everyone's coming into this main room uh, and we'll start in, in 30 seconds or so. So it looks like we've got uh, people have joined us. Welcome. Thank you uh, for joining uh, this session of a LAN portal webinar where we're going to be exploring some really important themes around open data, anti-corruption and land governance. My name is Tim Davies. Uh, I'm going to be uh, chairing our discussion uh, and we've got three fantastic expert panellists uh, with us who will each uh, introduce themselves shortly. Um, just to start, I'm going to set the scene uh, and tell you about the themes we'll be exploring and some of the angles we'll, we'll take before we come to our panellists. We'll then have a discussion uh, as a panel and then we'll also be open to your questions and inputs which you can put into the question or chat window uh, and that I will try and then pose as many of your questions as possible to, to our panellists. Um, so we're going to be exploring three themes uh, today. The first of those is clearly land governance, the core focus and work of the land portal. Secondly, we're going to be looking at the scourge of corruption and work to tackle corruption in relation to land. And lastly, we're going to be looking at open data as a promising tool to deploy in the fight against land related corruption. And this is a really timely debate right now. Um, ideas around open data have been on the global stage for almost a decade. And open data is at once a simple and a complex idea. The simple idea is that public data should be made accessible to the public, more transparent, data used as a resource so that records can be searched, sorted and analysed in new ways. The complex part is putting that into practice. Um, there can be some data that's held by public uh, agencies that, that can't be open by default. There can be power dynamics that mean releasing data has adverse effects and underlying uh, problems of poor data quality and public data systems can frustrate attempts to open it up. However, even with these general aspects of open data noted, in the recent State of Open Data book from the OD for D network, a, a book I was involved in co-editing, we explored how open data still holds great potential as a tool for anti-corruption. Um, yet in land, the global availability of data remains very patchy. And although millions of dollars have been spent on building land registration systems around the world, very few of those systems currently make data available. Um, and in part, that might reflect the need for nuance when it comes to land data. Um, there are particular issues of privacy and power that need a more sophisticated approach to be taken. And that was something that was particularly evident in the land debate we hosted on the land portal over September. And I believe many of you uh, joining us may have taken part in that. That was a dialogue where over three weeks we had 100 contributions from 48 different contributors pointing to the breadth of different data sets relevant to anti-corruption in land. From cadastres and land use information data sets to corporate registers and court records. In that dialogue, people pointed out the need for a multi-stakeholder approach that can achieve the right level of openness in land data and can make it easier for marginalized groups to discover data to support their struggles, whilst avoiding data digitization that reinforces gender bias or excludes particular groups. And in the write-up of that discussion that you'll find on the LAM portal, we highlight the need for work on research to understand the current state of land information, we highlight the need for experimentation that can find politically aware best fit approaches to use open data as an anti-corruption tool and we highlight the need for networking to spot knowledge sharing at regional and global levels. Now all those kind of interventions need support, they need knowledge, they need resourcing uh, and they need capacity building and that's where today's panel comes in to explore what are the forms of support that can be there to, to, to build work on open data in the land sector and what are the challenges we need to confront and engage with if we want that to move forward. And so this discussion is part two of a three-part process that's going to culminate at the Conference on Land Policy in Africa at the end of November. Um, uh, the first part being that online dialogue 
I mentioned. So as we get into those discussions, I'm going to invite each of our panelists now to briefly introduce themselves and which part of the open data anti-corruption and land governance landscape they come from. They'll have a few minutes each for that, and then we'll go into some questions to really get into some deeper discussion. And then very much, I hope, we'll come to your questions uh, to the panel, which just to remind you, you can put in that chat window at any point. So without further ado, Katie uh, Clancy, can I come to you first to ask you just to tell us two or three minutes about yourself, about the OD4D network, and why IDRC and OD4D have taken an interest in open data over the last decade as a, as a development issue. Yeah, thanks so much, Tim. So my name is Katie Clancy. I'm a program officer with International Development Research Center. Uh, and one of the projects I am responsible for coordinating is the Open Data for Development Network, which is a global partnership between IDRC, Global Affairs Canada, and the Hewlett Foundation to advance the creation of locally driven and sustainable open data ecosystems around the world. So OD4D works with leading open data organizations to create knowledge, to inform open data policies, develop new standards, um, innovation, and research. Uh, so a broad theory of change is understanding how open data's release and use is informing better development, in particular how it is increasing good governance, improving service delivery, and ultimately addressing information asymmetries in ways uh, that help people to exercise their rights. We have a really broad mandate, and our network is ultimately driven by six regional hubs that act as leaders, um, and that help to identify local priorities, as well as work with policymakers to pilot new innovations around data use um, and to inform uh, creation of new infrastructure and interoperability and build capacity uh, in both governments and civil society. So these hubs are the Africa Open Data Network, which is based in Kenya, and they actually do some work on land governance. Um, Open Data Asia, uh, which is based in Cambodia and Malaysia, and actually both of the partners, um, which include the CINAR, uh, the CINAR project, as well as um, Open Data Mekong, um, also work on these issues. Um, we have the Open Data Middle East and North Africa Network, uh, the Caribbean Open Institute, uh, ILDA, which is based in Uruguay, and the Communauté d'Afrique Francophone des Données Ouvertes, which is based in Burkina Faso. Um, so each of these regional networks ultimately uh, aim to create this local leadership and capacity. OD4D has also supported a number of global initiatives aimed at supporting the release and use and research on open data. So the, these include things like the Open Data Barometer, the Open Data Index, the International Open Data Conference, the State of Open Data that Tim was just discussing, and the Feminist Open Government Initiative. Uh, and our regional hubs are also working, for example, with Nati and the Open Data Charter um, to pilot new anti-corruption initiatives, and I'll let her get a little bit more into detail on, on what that looks like. Um, so OD4D Network has existed in this current form since 2015, but we've actually been doing work on open data and related issues since about 2010. And part of our initial interest was my team focuses on technology and innovation, um, and our interest is in better understanding the feedback loops and links and how uh, new technology innovations influence uh, existing development challenges and issues. So we take a really broad view and have a broad mandate. Uh, we tend to be informed by social science, but also by technology issues, and we want to understand the long chain. So we're not just interested in releasing open data, but ultimately in understanding how open data um, is put into use and drives development impact. And so that involves taking both a, a positivist but also a critical um, perspective on open data uh, issues. And so the land governance space is not one that I am necessarily an expert in, so please be gentle with me, but it's definitely an area that I think we're quite interested in and one that we've uh, uh, been interested in exploring but also a little bit cautious about in the past in part due to some initial publications, for example, from Michael Gerstein um, around the Boomi project. Uh, and so we're really interested in understanding how open data can increase light rights and decrease harms. Um, and so we want to take a really holistic view and perspective when we work with our partners uh, to explore these issues to make sure that we're um, ultimately supporting work that, that's improving development outcomes and minimizing potential harms to security or privacy, for example. So that's it in a nutshell, and I'll be happy to get into it more in a bit. 
Thank you, Katie. That, that's really useful to see that long-term interest in open data, but also already some of those tensions that come up, particularly around land that we'll be digging into. Um, I'd like to come next to, to Peter now. Uh, you've been involved in the land sector for many years, both as, a, as an innovator and now working as a funder supporting work on property rights. Um, could I invite you just to tell us a bit briefly about yourself, your role, and the particular perspective, perspectives that that gives you uh, on work around anti-corruption in land? Yeah, thanks, Tim, and thanks to the Land Portal for hosting the webinar. It's a pleasure to, to be here with my fellow panelists, Katie and, and Natty. Um, thanks to everyone also for joining, no matter where you are. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, my name is Peter Abley. I've been at Amidia Network for seven years. We are uh, an impactor investor or a philanthropic capital firm. That is, we deploy uh, money either as grants or for-profit investments towards social, positive social change. And I lead one of our initiatives, one of our six initiatives called Property Rights. And put simply, we think the world is a better place when people have their property rights. Uh, and the problem is many people don't have any formal uh, property rights whatsoever. Prior to ON, I was in the commercial sector running uh, software and technology companies often related to geospatial remote sensing and uh, land registry and mapping and taxation. Um, I, I think the notion of open data is an interesting one. And I think we have a more ambivalent view about how important open data is and how much it can help towards uh, corruption in land. So I'm looking forward to um, having that discussion here. Um, and uh, again, happy to be on the, on the call. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and last but not least on our panel, I come to uh, Natty. Um, now, Natty, you've seen the development of open data from a number of different sides, both inside government and, and, and now working in civil society and multi-stakeholder context. So can I ask you to share a bit of your background uh, and in particular, how the open data charter has been exploring these connections between open data and anti-corruption across the board uh, uh, and, and then more recently looking at that land connection. Yep. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for the invite. As Tim said, I'm Nati Karfi. I'm now the Deputy Director of the Open Data Charter. Uh, but in my previous uh, life, I used to be a government official. I run the open government policy for Argentina until May last year. And prior to that, I was head of open government for the Chilean government. Uh, in Bachelet's second uh, second government, um, so I've been I've been I've been working on open government and open data for over eight years now in a row, um, mostly from government, but now I'm seeing the perspective from from civil society. As far as the open data charter work on open data and anti corruption goes, um, we've been working closely with many of of our partners. The the open data charter uh, is. It's consisted of a network of governments of different levels and, and in different parts of, of the globe and multilateral and civil society organizations uh, from, from everywhere. And uh, we've been exploring with our partners how the connection between open data and anti-corruption goes. And in a practical exercise we've developed alongside with other partners, what is now known as the Open Up Guide on Anti-Corruption, which is a set of 30, key data sets that any government would want to open if they want to engage in an open data and anti-corruption policy. And we've managed to, to test that guide in insight. Uh, firstly, in, in Mexico, which was a very interesting, a, a very interesting project, a very interesting, um, a very interesting idea to test. Uh, we had many discoveries there uh, because often uh, theory and practice don't, don't matter exactly. For example, in Mexico, just as a like as, as a number, um, the 30 data sets turned out to be 64 in Mexico uh, because of the way the government gathers and collects the, the information. Land data is one of the key 30 data sets that is uh, that that is part of the Open Up Guide. And uh, what we are seeing in, in both in Mexico and in other implementations that we're not doing is that is not part of the key data sets that, that governments actually want to start the work with uh, when they're talking about opening up data for anti-corruption. 
and um, as, K as Katie mentioned, we're now working with closely with the Open Government Partnership, also in a project revolving around open data and anti-corruption uh, commitments. Uh, but I would want to talk a little bit more about that uh, on, on, a, on a, in a bit. Fantastic, thank you all. So what we see there is a picture of many years work on open data, uh, some emerging work in connecting that to land, but also something that came out of the dialogue we had was that there are some big gaps. There's perhaps not been as much activity on open data in the land sector as some had uh, anticipated there could be or thought we might uh, be able to benefit from open data as an anti-corruption tool. So in our first set of questions, I want to dig into into that gap and what are the reasons we see uh, and what are the, some of the particular challenges that work on uh, pursuing open data as an anti-corruption tool in land need to in, in, in engage with. Um, and maybe on that I can come to you first, Peter. Um, I, I know you've got colleagues at Luminate who've worked a lot on the open data agenda and Midiar's worked a lot on property rights. Um, but we don't really see any high profile open data land anti-corruption initiatives out there. Why, why do you think that is and what are the challenges we need to be thinking about? Yeah, thanks Tim. I think um, first of all it's probably because land itself is low down on the development agenda and many other things get far more attention whether it's health, education, um, financial inclusion or the latest shiny fintech uh, tool. Um, land is also an issue that many donors um, tend to shy away from because rightly or wrongly they feel that they'll do more harm than good by getting engaged and ultimately it's a, a sovereign issue that uh, should be managed solely by, by that state. So a lot of the engagement and funding typically has come from bilateral funding relationships, uh, government to government. Um, and in fact, most of the funding and resources has gone into trying to upgrade and upskill um, those institutions nationally that deal with land, land issues. Um, and that's been the classic form of, of aid delivery, if you will, over the last 50 to 60 years. So I think it's, it's a small issue. It's an issue people typically don't want to touch. And they'll go into, um, should I dare say, easier things that everyone can get their heads around, like putting everyone in school or giving everyone a vaccine shot. Um, and uh, and land is is a is a little bit more tricky uh, than those things. So I think in general, it's useful to set the this, this scene there. And then I think you guys are far more expert in open data than me. But in talking to my Luminate colleagues, I think this open data journey is only just beginning in general when you compare to many other things. And the jury is still out as to the efficacy of much of it. Um, including governments signing up to OGP um, and then having a, a special person at the president's office and who then gets frustrated by the line ministries who have no intention of living up to the commitments the national government made. So I think still early days, even on the open data, uh, digging in and, and having uh, traction. And, um, and so I think those two items is probably why, in general, open data for land, in my opinion, anyway, is, is further down the, uh, the interest ladder, if you would. That, that's really useful framing to take that bigger picture. Uh, now, Katie, you've already touched a bit on how land has had some particular features as a sector. And in the od for d work, you've looked across a wide range of different sectors. Are you seeing reasons why land might be different or are you seeing learning from other sectors that you think we should be bringing across into the land land space? It's a really good question. Um, I think uh, overall uh, within OD4D, I mean, Peter has made an excellent point, you know, despite having worked on these issues for 10 years, in many ways they're only just reaching maturity at this point. Um, and so despite a lot of investments and, and efforts in a variety of different sectors, we're seeing, you know, we've built out some of the infrastructure within governments and some capacity within civil society, but there's a lot more work to do. So one of our core challenges is just around prioritization is in that there's so many different um, sectors. But I think for us, um, there's a lot of learning that could be brought into the land sector. Uh, definitely, we're seeing a lot. Uh, I think there's a lot of work from, um, for example, on, on contracting and procurement that could be uh, useful, um, you know, having read through some of the initial discussions. Um, 
from last month around the availability and, and the variety of different actors. Um, I think that there's a lot of room for uh, sort of multi-stakeholder dialogues to start to kick off. In many cases, we're dealing with a supply and demand um, context and, and there's a need to bring together these different stakeholders and provide them with, with additional capacity and support. And that includes um, working with you know, potentially land ministries who might not have received as much focus um, uh, from the open data actors as maybe some other key ministries like within agriculture um, or or uh, the ministries of ICTs who are, you know, I think working a lot more on, on issues relating to data and information sharing. Um, I think that there are still uh, concerns around um, privacy and security, and, and I think a lot of different governments have those um, fears around data sharing or around, you know, doing open by default approaches, which doesn't mean that they should stop, but it means that we need to do more work to build their capacity and, and to engage on those issues. Uh, and then I think that there are a lot of opportunities and again, that comes down to like multi-stakeholder dialogues. And I would also love to see more case studies on where um, open data approaches have been useful or have been driving, you know, even initial kinds of impact. Because I think where we as funders see um, interest or activity uh, ongoing, a lot of our focus, again, coming back to priorities and having limited resources uh, is um, focusing more on, on low-hanging fruit. And I think uh, Peter, you know, sort of articulated it very well that there are a lot of different development priority areas and you know we see a, a broad mandate within um, better governance but you know if you can get more um, if there if there's a higher regional priority and, and there's more interest on working on uh, agriculture or procurement issues then we're more likely to support those so it, it also comes down to regional prioritization so working with local actors um, uh, and, and having those kinds of dialogues um, with both domain experts, but also technical experts who can start to, to spearhead and explore interesting issues. Um, that those are maybe some spaces because I think Peter's right that you know the open data experiment is still ongoing. We we're starting to see some really I think high impact activities that state of open data book captures some really interesting case studies. But it, it's a long um, process, it's a long cycle to drive this kind of impact in use, and so uh, that that's an area that for us you know we need to keep exploring. Fantastic, thank you, Katie. And and I think I'm seeing in there some of the journey the the Open Data Chart has already been on, from talking very much about open by default to a focus on publishing with purpose and connecting data with particular problem spaces. And Natty, you mentioned the the Open Up guides you've been developing and and the one on anti corruption, which I understand you're currently in the process of kind of rolling out or piloting and and using in different countries. Are you seeing a, an appetite to engage with land or, or wherever people wanting to put their energy right now? Yes, thanks, Tim. Um, so with the Open Up guide, what we did was, as I said, pilot it in in, in Mexico. Uh, but now the Open Up Guide on Honest Corruption is part of a hemispheric program of the Organization of American States. So 33 countries decided to take on the challenge of opening up uh, data for anti-corruption and using the Open Up Guide as a framework. Um, so one good lesson about this, this guide in particular and, and any guide uh, that we develop is that having uh, one request for governments, so this is like implement this guide, actually made the conversation be between 33 countries easier. Uh, so when they decided that they wanted to tackle anti-corruption using op open data, uh, they had they had this framework to discuss on. So that's a, a very good lesson that we learned um, probably um, with with this, this with the discussion. Aside from from this program, we are now working with Colombia and Ecuador also implementing uh, or starting to implement this, this guide in, in the conversations. And uh, they are very keen on, on working on this because uh, the idea was for open data to move past the bit of transparency and anti-corruption. But uh, unfortunately, we've seen many cases of corruption, especially in, in Latin America, where the corruption networks are very well entangled and connected between countries. So trying to open up data 
uh, that actually is standardized and can make can make uh, can help make comparisons across national borders is actually something that is now more needed than than ever um, and now we have the capacity to do so uh, as far as land data as as i said in in the introduction out of the 30 data sets of the open up guide is is unfortunately one of the ones that gets uh, that gets behind the, the, every country seems or every government seems to be uh, willing to start by procurement data um, lobby registration and uh, and and other types of, of data sets aside from from the land uh, one mostly uh, i don't i don't know the, the exact reasons but i think mostly because of the quality and the quantity of data that they've gathered around land data um which is which is uh, in many of the cases not good and not enough to even open uh so that 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 particular data set gets left behind for uh for the long run publication plan uh when they are working with the open up guide on on anti corruption that, that's really interesting so some of the just land again being seen as a really challenging one not the low hanging fruit to, to to grapple with and i think also as comes up in what you've said there the fact that this is a cross-border problem so the challenge is not just building national data infrastructures but it's finding the connections uh, across borders and i wanted to come to that theme next of cross-border collaboration and, and how we foster that or support that um, because I think although we recognize that work on anti-corruption in the global south is a long-term change process, uh, we have seen some gains in recent years in a few countries publishing more land-related data. So, for example, the UK disclosing corporate-owned land uh, and land transactions being published in a number of countries and increasingly beneficial ownership data, at least for companies involved in land deals, being, being increasingly kind of in open registers. Um, uh, and now, Peter, I, I started thinking about this when, when, as we were preparing for this webinar, you talked about the need to look at corruption not only in the Global South, but also in the UK, the US, in Europe, um, uh, as well as looking at those land grabs in the Global South. And I wonder if you could say a bit more about how uh, developed world corruption vectors fit into this picture as we're trying to open up the landscape. Yeah, I mean, Again, I think back to basics, land is a very valuable asset. And as W.C. Fields famously said, uh, buy land, they ain't making more of it. Um, so as, as the world develops, we're going to see more and more pressure on land because it is such a valuable, a valuable asset. One only has to look at Scotland and the ownership structures of land in Scotland to understand that uh, a handful of people own 80% of the land and many communities are under leasing agreements and, and arrangements. <clears throat> and that's only recently come to light as, as people have began to campaign and, and get to the registers and, and open them up. Also land registers in particular always served a different function. They, they sort of weren't built for um, uh, like procurement, which is how you spend the government purse that has a much more natural feel to say well how are we spending our taxpayers money as opposed to i don't want people knowing about my land why should i care about putting that on a public register whereas i care much more about how the government's spending my tax money so i think you know just simply having that uh, frame of reference you, you know also what we see is um and i think we don't talk enough about is that the information about land is itself an asset and is viewed as an asset by those who manage and control it and they would like to extract it whether you are uh, an employee in a, in a land institution in colombia that says i get paid 50 dollars a month to do my job but somebody's willing to come and pay me an awful lot of money to speed a transaction through the system you're not going to be interested in transparency around that land data information right and then conversely in the north we see models in, in uh, the UK, for example, Ordnance Survey, that essentially says, we're a trading fund, the data is our asset, we return money to the treasury every year, and we will set a 75 year copyright on it, and we're very against open data, but not from the perspective of, of uh, sort of corruption, but from the fact that, you know, they view it as a commercial asset uh, that they will maintain and gatekeep around. So I, I think it's interesting to look at different different aspects, uh, both in the north and the south. 
The final point is, of course, as you mentioned before, there are different types of cadastres. Cadaster essentially means book about land, and we have mining cadasters, right? We have other types of cadasters, um, and governments don't share those either, and they have very little interest in sharing them. Um, there have been some attempts around contracts and land. There's the Open Land Contracts Hub that Columbia University has set up and maintains that currently has about 22 countries reporting against for open land contracts. Uh, so there have been some attempts there. So it, it's an interesting issue in that it, it manifests itself in many different ways depending on where you are in the globe and how people see the asset and the value around the asset. That's really useful for you, Peter. Um, Katie, I wanted to pick up on the question of kind of capacity building with people to use the data that is there, because I think so often we c there's always a gap of data. More things could be available, but as Peter's outlined, there's often a lot of politics power and, and, and perverse incentives to making things more open. But with the information we have got, um, how, from a development funder's perspective, uh, can we build capacity for people to use the data that's being made available, that, that later chain of, of kind of use of their experiences you've got from OD for D's work or, or, or wider networks? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, for us, this is such a, a tricky playing field because it is such, um, uh, as a you know as part of Canada's international assistance portfolio there's a lot of power and politics that go on here and, and Peter was discussing sovereignty earlier but that being said you know at the same time our model at IDRC is very much to empower and build the capacity of local actors to pursue a lot of that work so a good example I think from our past work was around the Panama Papers and the very wide release of data, which wasn't necessarily a government release of data. It was a whistleblower who leaked it. But um, one thing that uh, that we were able to do both through the OD4D network and, and through uh, other networks was to support capacity, not necessarily for us to do any kind of analysis with it because it's not you know our mandate, but to support, for example, journalists. Um, and researchers to build their capacity around how to use and analyze that data and to better understand the linkages of that data to their own country um, and priorities. I was able to actually lead to some very interesting revelations um, and some very interesting follow-ups that came up afterwards as a result of the analysis of that data. So I think we see that there's a strong need. There's a lot of intermediaries who exist. So we need to build the capacity both of, of sort of policymakers and, and Peter, a lot of those workers that you're discussing to build those, a lot of the people who ma manage the information system. And I think there will always be a tension around the commercialization of that data. Um, but then also around, for example, um, the intermediaries that include like researchers, uh, uh, civil society groups, and there's a, a really wide range of them, many of whom sort of lack the technical capacity at the moment to do really interesting kinds of data analysis. And more and more we're seeing that as an area of focus um, where we can potentially help people use the data that's being released to exercise their rights and address information asymmetries. Um, and so that's a really sort of important focus area, I think, uh, in terms of driving that that longer chain of, of use and, and being able to use data in, way, in a variety of different ways that can help to, um, you know, whether it's to, to demand accountability, whether it's to foster more information or, or analysis about a particular issue. Um, whether, for example, I think there's some really interesting gender debates that are going on, you know, how we can include other rights groups in exploring um, uh, some of those issues from a data-focused perspective, that there's a, a lot of really important avenues um, that contribute both to the anti-corruption angle, um, but also to other sort of more rights-focused angles as well that are, are very important and, and potentially really a lot more powerful um, in terms of holding both their own countrymen, but also uh, other countries to account um, where we've signed on to international agreements that uh, around financial, illicit financial flows uh, and more. So we're really seeing the connections here between work on land and a number of different fields if we're going to put this all together and something coming out there a lot about all the different stakeholders involved. So I'm going to start bringing in a few of the questions we're getting in uh, through the chat and if other people have questions they'd like to pose please do start uh, posting those in. But uh, John, De John Dean 
Uh, Marcunas was, was asking about this question of who the different stakeholders are who need to be part of a change process. Um, and I think, Katie, you've just touched on some of those, so I'm going to put that question actually to, to Natty initially uh, to reflect on some of the ways the work of the Charter or other fora in the open data and open government space can help convene different stakeholders and who are the kinds of stakeholders we need at the table in order to advance work both on data availability but also crucially on data being used to make a difference. Thanks team. Um, so one thing that we've learned the, the open up the open up guides uh, that the charter creates um, are, are more than just the anti-corruption one we have one on agriculture data one on climate change uh, but they all have the same logic behind and so whenever we're implementing one of the guides we always uh, have one or two workshops inside in uh, in the country that we're implementing that with data pu publishers and data reusers. And what we say is um, in those workshops, we create, um, we create people interoperability. It's not just about data interoperability. We need people to actually connect and know each other and, and discuss. Um, and so it's important uh, to get the right actors in the room. Uh, when we talk about anti-corruption, it depends on the in, in institutional arrangements each of the country has, uh, because some countries have uh, an, an anti-corruption office that depends on the presidency. Other have, uh, other have anti-corruption offices that are uh, totally autonomous from, from the government. Uh, other have zillion of organizations that work for anti-corruption but not a single office so we have to evaluate and and understand the institutional arrangement of, the, of each of the country and then understand also uh civil society um, community in in that country both the open data and the anti-corruption one because we need uh, both uh, sets of knowledge together in the same room because as, as katie said not not every office has like data literacy within themselves within the city so we need the anti-corruption organizations to be working hand in hand with the open data community within that country um, part of the work that we do in as i said in each of the countries that we implement the guide is try to help out making that making those connections with the purpose of uh, and the the idea of in uh, actually implementing that and that is what people bring that they, that is what brings people together um as far as international fora goes um the open government partnership actually uh promotes this this kind of dialogues between governmental officials and, and civil society organizations and, and academics and so uh what we've seen is out of the anti-corruption open up guide the the data sets that um that are being more engaging for governments are the ones that also uh, have like a, a, a formal initiative behind, like uh, procurement data. The Open Contracting Partnership, which also collaborates with the Open Government Partnership, actually has made a good point in helping out governments uh, creating these commitments and then implementing them. So when governments see that that they are not alone, then in the implementation of of the of the opening of the data, uh, they they obviously tend to be uh, more prone to opening up that data because it's not just uh, it's not just pushing on buttons and, and opening up the data. You have to do a proper work, uh, and and so whenever there's an international community behind an international initiative behind, those seems to be seem to be uh, the ones that that governments tend to open more, um, just because they know there's there's help out there and there's actually a community that's going to help not only open up the data but get the conversation going with their users um so that's that's something that i i think uh, it's it's something important to learn from from these global initiatives on certain types of data the ones the initiatives that are uh, that are working on a theme between the open data uh, even within the open data and anti-corruption uh, policy Fantastic. Uh, and I wonder if, if we can switch track now to looking at some of those examples uh, that, that, 
as you have, have cited their examples from the procurement space or other spaces, but any examples either from land or other neighbouring spaces that we look at and think that's showing us where either the low-hanging fruit might be in this land anti-corruption and open data space, or that's showing us an example that we really can learn from to do something more. For example, Peter, you mentioned open land contracts, but are there are other things you look at and say there's some promise there, even if there's a long way to go. Uh, anything that comes to mind for you? Yeah, I. Uh, so what I think is interesting is that um, land data in particular works because typically the official data, and it's worth distinguishing between official data that recorded by a registry or a government agency, tends to work because it's singular, um, unless it's a federated state or a provincial structure government like uh, Canada, where you might have then eight or nine. Um, registries. It's not as if you have within government 23 different departments that are procuring within one government entity. Uh, land data officially works because it's singular in nature. It's a single register, a single source of information, which which creates a lot of the uh, perverse incentives for, for not doing things. We have more and more data available to us that allows us to go around official registers, right? And so one of our grantees is Global Witness, and we funded them to do more work on using satellite imagery and drones, for example, to get at uh, what's clearly going on on the land if the official data is not forthcoming or available. And so I think we've seen good examples there. I don't think what we need is more guides or more, I think there's plenty of information and knowledge out there. Um, uh, we have 17 guides on the voluntary guidelines for land tenure. Um, we, in fact, did a guide to the guides as a sort of bit of a tongue in cheek. So I would I would ask all of the community that we don't need more guides and we don't need more models. I think we have enough. Um, I think if you're going to get real scale change on land, you have to engage the commercial sector and you have to try and align incentives. And I think the one example that I've seen that uh, from the north is actually out of uh, Cambridge and Digital Built Britain, which is something called the Gemini Principles. Um, as, as geospatial technology gets more and more efficient and the cost of collecting data gets lower and lower, we're actually now in the stage of creating a one-to-one -one model of the world around us, digital model, hence the term digital twin, and therefore the Gemini Principles. And I think the Gemini Principles were put together by a combination of commercial interests, academic, civil society, and government, who said there are many issues related to uh, the collection of data at this scale and this frequency that go well beyond um, disadvantaged groups and so forth and get into deep ethical and other considerations. But there's a very simple set of nine principles around how that works. And I think that Gemini principle set works because it's got everybody, it allows everybody to engage positively from, from agreeing to those principles, including the commercial sector and including the government. And, and I think it's a matter of, therefore, in aligning incentives. And it may be in many developing countries at the moment, it's not possible to align those incentives. And therefore, it's purely an advocacy play for the next five to 10 years. And, and that may be the only reason, the only way we get any sort of uh, traction on the issue. And that's okay, we should call it out and say, this is an advocacy play. It's nothing more, nothing less, and we're not gonna expect government to really do anything because we're just chipping away from the outside. But um, yeah, let me stop there because uh, I, I think hopefully that's uh, a useful couple of examples. That, that's really useful, Peter, and I think you point there to, to something that comes out in a lot of early advocacy for open data, which was recognising this isn't just there for anti-corruption, this isn't just there for transparency, this has to be there to align the interests of innovators, technology, developers, government itself. Um, so maybe then, Natty, I could come to you because that's something obviously you've worked with in the Charter of how you align those different incentives and on whether it makes sense to have a guide that's focused purely on anti-corruption or, or those data sets you're talking about. Do you just talk about them in terms of anti-corruption or do you pick up on those other narratives of why sharing this data matters? The idea behind, um, thanks for the question, and uh, the idea behind the guide was just to, we didn't create any new standards, we didn't create any new data sets, we just 
put in order the the data the data that was that was out there and we worked with of of course with transparency organizations to build up that guide so we made it easier for governments to actually um, have that discussion about open data and its corruption and that's the logic behind the of the of the open up guides uh, which is with organizations actually know more about it that we're working on and gathering and collecting the already exist, existing standards and putting that information together because um, having a zillion guides can be sometimes challenging and 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 being bringing the wrong conversations with with governments and then one of the of the key work that we do in in anything that we do in the charter is actually um, building up in the mode of a publishing with a purpose we don't we don't want to open data just because of the sake of opening up data um, the opening up data on anti-corruption is not going to solve uh, corruption. We need data reusers, journalists, academics, uh, NGOs, civil society organizations of any kind actually being able to use that data and bring light into whatever is going on that shouldn't be going on. Um, but first trying to understand what the key issue in each of the of the countries is and understanding what the purpose of the of the policy on open data and anti-corruption is is the first milestone of any implementation of in, that we do in any of the countries um, the anti-corruption agenda is a big one and each of the countries has its its, its own um, key problems that they want to tackle and so maybe trying to open up the 30 data sets at the same time is not the solution it's trying to understand uh, which uh, which of these data sets are actually the, the cornerstone for the fight on corruption in those countries. Um, but I think uh, that is also something that we need to explore and understand on a, on a country per country basis. Uh, and then, of course, if there's the possibility, as I said, um, the cor corruption um, corruption or corruptive or, or cor corruptive organizations actually work uh, fast by the limits of each of the countries so if, if you want to if you want to actually tackle corruption at least in in the northern south out of the my personal uh, my personal um, experience it would be good to try to um, make collaboration between countries actually happen and i think land land data that could actually help out with that also Fantastic. Tim, could I could I just jump Please in do. on that? Natty, can I ask you what would the incentive be for two countries to work together on on sharing land data? I do think that any of the data sets in in the in the guide can actually bring in a new light to between uh, organizations that foster or promote corruption between the between the countries. So any of the theory data sets is actually Oh, we've just lost Natty there, breaking up slightly. So, so we'll come back to that theme, and I'll try and draw that out a bit more uh, in a while. Uh, but maybe coming to you, Katie, uh, on this round, just around kind of examples or cases you look at and you think we can learn from that. And I want to pick up from one of the questions that we've had through from from Gavin Heyman, who's particularly interested in cases that are um, protecting the rights of marginalised groups. Um, and I know some of the OD for D network have looked at that. So maybe you can reflect on those cases you find uh, oh you are muted Katie thank you <laughs> I was just being played thank you so much that that's a really interesting um, question and I think in a way um, one that kind of starts to chip away at the complexity of the space that we're talking about Peter on the one hand is talking about some of the uh, commercialization and innovation dialogues and we deal with this tension a lot with OD4D but then we're also talking about this for development side of things so we see this sort of sometimes the tension between social and economic forces um, and the political will behind addressing one or the other um, so some of our I would say quite interesting work that's been coming out um, lately through both our feminist open government initiative some of the work that's on the ground is working with, for example, um, indigenous groups around uh, learning more about data advocacy, and that covers a lot of different ground, or working with women um, to develop a, a better understanding of, for example, femicides in Latin America. 
So these aren't necessarily linked to land data yet, although they might be at some point. Um, <laughs> there's some really interesting analysis, but uh, what some of the complexities of dealing with these spaces are understanding, and, and I think Peter's right about the, like what's in it for me, or, or you know what different actors have to bring to the table, but the more you can convene them together, um, whether those are in small meetings, um, whether those are in uh, workshops that, that deliberately attempt to bring together this, these multiple stakeholder perspectives, um, whether these are through uh, uh, research uh, um, sort of activities that where you're working directly with, for example, uh, data providers and data users to better understand both of their needs. Because sometimes they're just not talking to each other uh, and there's no, um, it's just a lack of information and, and not necessarily um, any anything else um, versus other times, you know, there are very much tension between different groups and their different perspectives and needs um, and, and their different sort of advocacy approaches. And so recognizing uh, and, and recognizing the complexity of those issues, uh, more you can bring them together to at least start to have these dialogues has been a really important thing that we've been finding in terms of dealing with um, marginalized groups in, in terms of being able to exercise their rights. So some of that comes through capacity building activities and some of it comes through that deliberative dialogue. Um, there's no doubt that it's challenging, uh, in part because of the different perspectives that, that might be emerging in some of these spaces and the local context that they're working in uh, and the level of trust. I mean, that's one of the sort of underlying premises behind open data, at least, at, at, and, and I don't know that this has been proven at all, and Peter, feel free to poke holes in this, is that um, open data was supposed to, by increasing the sort of transparency and accountability, was all ultimately supposed to lead to enhanced trust between governments and citizens of all different um, kinds. And I, I would say that the jury is definitely still out as to whether that hypothesis is true. But it certainly, uh, the approaches that I would say the open data community has had in the past, which is bringing together people who have both substantive expertise with technical experts, with policymakers, um, and particularly now in, in deliberately reaching out to, to marginalized groups um, to, to start to engage and understand how these approaches are working has yielded some interesting initial results and might be an approach that's worth um, uh, you know, dealing with a little bit more in the future. But these are complex dialogues, there's no doubt about it. Um, and they, they can lead to some really interesting uh, challenges as well. Fantastic, uh, I'm just gonna check, Natty, are you still with us uh, on the call at the moment? So we may have lost Natty for, for the moment, hopefully we'll get Natty reconnected. Uh, but that puts Peter and Katie in the hot seat as I start going to some of the questions that they're all our, all our uh, uh, webinar participants have been sharing. So I'm going to just start bringing in some of those. Uh, uh, I might direct those to one or the other of you, but, but if, 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 if others want to, to jump in, please, please do. Um, so uh, starting out, um, we had just a clarification question from uh, uh, Annette uh, Jaitner uh, asking when we talk open data, are we really looking only at government data or more broadly? And I think Peter, you started to pick up on that topic, but uh, may maybe I can just put that directly to you. Do you see this as a, a government data only question or, or something broader than that? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Just one quick point, and uh, hello, Gavin, thank you for that question. Uh, and uh, Katie, they're, they're, um, so the indigenous uh, groups who make claims about their lands, um, one of the areas that we've had to be very careful with in the land field is in fact indigenous groups who uh, find themselves often, if they put themselves on the map, can be at risk for exploitation and various other things. And so there are organizations like Cadastra that we fund and um, uh, the tenure facility uh, that work very carefully with these groups to provide you know, the tools and understanding of what data should you share, if at all, and under what circumstances. Uh, there's no disagreement that they need to collect the data to state their claim, but it's how do you share it? And so there are uh, numerous examples um, and good groups who've, who've done work uh, around that cadastre and tenure facility being the two the two key ones. I think around the, the data itself, you know, what's really interesting is this asymmetry that now exists 
if you look at, let's say, sub-Saharan Africa and you look at the, the official data sets that just simply aren't there because governments aren't able to collect them or don't want to or both, um, you know, Facebook now knows far more about the citizens of Zambia than the government of Zambia does itself. And I'm not sure that's necessarily a good thing. Um, and the, the platforms that have the power to and the money and resources to collect data from ever more improving tools like satellite imagery, machine learning and other things that allow us to calculate where populations are at great fidelity and temporal frequency belong now in the hands of, of extremely powerful platforms. Um, and that data can't be used for the public good. So I think we should broaden the conversation. In fact, we've just funded the Geovation Center in, in the UK's Ordnance Survey to talk about the ethics around spatial data and whether or not more of this data that uh, commercial entities collect or are interested in collecting should also be opened up and made available for research purposes and, and non-commercial use, given that it's likely that government entities in many countries will never be able to collect data uh, at that scale. And therefore, there's no public good purpose, which is one of the things that you want to open up data for. Um, so what, what, how do we think about open data when it belongs to very powerful private platforms? I would posit that there's a, there's a role and a need for a dialogue around engaging these powerful commercial entities to make more of their data more open and less restrictive. And it doesn't just mean making it open on Google Maps because the license terms are extremely restrictive if you then want to use those, those data sets to create your own data sets. They then say, well, we get to use those as well for our own purposes. So, um, I would like to see the dialogue broadened out more around open data, not just to be around official uh, government data sets. Yes. That, that raises some really key themes, really, this question of what data from who should be, how open and to whom. Uh, not too many <laughs> parts of that question, but I'll, I'll pick that up to something Priscilla Cubo is asking, uh, particularly asking about if anyone has experience with the CAR, the Rural Environmental Registry in Brazil, uh, where she comments there were several debates and conflicts about it due to the risk of ownership loss or lack of trust uh, with the government. So uh, I don't know, I'm seeing Peter nodding a bit, but maybe Katie, if I come to you first, you talked about Boomi and other cases where there are these, these, these privacy kind of concerns, um, either from that Brazilian case or other cases, have you seen how this has played out of, of, of these questions about trust and fear of, of loss of ownership? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think we're, we're now getting into some of the really uh, tangible and current discussions. And, and Peter, your points are excellently placed, I think, as part of this as well. And there's new discussions around indigenous data sovereignty and what indigenous data sharing should look like. When we have talked about open data in the past, um, we take a broad view. Uh, open data means data with an open license, mostly from government, but also from other sources, um, and and the utility of that. And so then getting down to the, these questions around, um, we haven't worked that much with CIR. Unfortunately, we don't work that much in Brazil at the moment. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll I'll leave that to to Peter to discuss a little bit more since he seems a lot more familiar with with them. But I think um, around the questions of, of data sharing and data ownership, I mean the ideal. There's okay, there's a difference between the ideal and and the reality, and I think we need to. I, except that there's a very broad spectrum. And we've definitely seen that in a lot of the work that we're doing. There's a lot of, I would say, um, Northern governments that have strong sort of regimes that are very much trying to promote, you know, they, they have strong underlying access to information laws, they have strong intellectual property regimes, and even they are struggling with it. And so we need to understand that, that um, there's very much a spectrum of data sharing and data openness. But the ideal standard is that the data that's being produced by both governments um, and, and owned by them and also by other groups and potentially shared, um, you know, there, there are a number of licensing and sharing regimes that are available and, and I, there are new experiments and different kinds of data sharing that might be useful. But uh, coming back to Tim's in, uh, initial premise, which is that sharing data, particularly data produced by governments, should be made openly available. 
um, but data produced by, by other organizations with a public interest um, focus might also want to make that data available because there is utility in combining and using those data sets. Um, we have to get to the understanding that, um, you know, we, we need to be using sort of uh, creative commons models that, that allow, but, but that don't necessarily attribute ownership to one group or that allow for remixing and reuse. Um, and that these need to be approaches and these are approaches that are being thought through within, within the open data community on how best to do this. I think in the land rights um, sector, coming back to this boom, we, I mean, I think we share your concerns and this is actually another one of the the reasons or, or risks why we've been a bit hesitant in this space is that there's, uh, uh, I think, a number of, of security as well as privacy risks. Um, uh, our, we, IDRC, not my team necessarily, works a lot in agriculture um, and we work a lot in different governance. We, we work in fragile contexts and we've seen a lot of abuse that emerges from information asymmetries or that can come from people seizing, um, you know, with knowledge and the know-how seizing um, information and, and using it to their own ends and not, not being able to be used for the benefit of, of local communities when that's what it's shared and intended for. Um, and so these are very much, I would just say, tensions are still being worked out. I don't think there's an easy answer to that. But that being said, you know, there are new models around data collaboratives, data trusts, and other different kinds of data sharing that are being explored um, as a means to, to address some of these ownership and trust challenges. So, you know, it's an active question and an active space for experimentation and one that I think we're definitely interested in. So it strikes me there's something really interesting for us to take away here from the dialogue so far about the information asymmetries uh, being a key concern that we need to understand in more depth rather than just open data as a tool. It's which information asymmetries are most harmful and should we address. Uh, I think we've got Natty connected again, but before we come to a question with Natty, Peter, I noticed you uh, might have something to say on the CAR uh, specifically. Yeah, first of all, we funded um, CPI, a climate policy initiative, along with PUC University in Rio, uh, Department of Economics, to do a series of, of documents about land land issues, uh, car um, as well. Um, th this is sort of a case of you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. I think the intention behind cars was good, which is to get an uh, up-to-date register to uh, help uh, control deforestation and also as a means to get subsidies uh, as well as official recognition. I think like anything in these situations, you have to realize that most of it probably goes reasonably well and there are always edge cases and you have to try and plan for how you deal with the edge cases. What you can't do is not let perfect be the enemy of good. You have to move forward. If you're going to get 80% of people on car and it works well, then ring fence and deal with the 20%, but don't hold up the 20% as a reason not to move forward. Um, uh, so, and Boomi is another sort of uh, ghost that's held up and, ooh, look at Boomi. But, you know, Boomi was the first digitization process in, uh, in India, uh, in Karnataka. And uh, what it did, interestingly enough, was simply shift the power dynamic from the local TESOL officers and revenue officers and local traders in land, that power imbalance was always there. It wasn't made because Boomi came along. What it did is shift the power imbalance to those that could access the data and make something of it, mostly actually investors from Mumbai, who then got access to the records and, and started doing nasty things in high value land areas. Um, disenfranchising, actually, not the local villager in the case of Bumi, but really the local traders that had traditionally done it. And those traders, uh, while they benefited, it was less pernicious on the local vi villagers because it was in their self-interest to maintain and limit the amount of extraction that they were realizing at the village level, whereas that's not the case of investors from Mumbai. So there's always kind of a nuance. And I would argue it's better to be digital and deal with these issues at scale because the overall benefit is better than not being digital, which is, you know, we still get tremendous amounts of abuse going on when things are not digitalized. Um, so just those are two quick comments there for you, Tim, on, on Boomi and uh, Car. Fantastic. So I'm going to come to a question uh, from Annette in a moment that will kind of wrap up some of those, those themes. But before we get there, um, uh, 
Gabriella uh, Macedo has put a question on how we see the participation of civil society in public policy for building open data as a way to avoid data that is just for government. So how does civil society engagement help shape data so it can be used by other stakeholders? And that feels natty like that's a question that, that could perhaps come, come in your direction. Sorry, first of all, sorry for like internet went totally down. Um, so now that I'm back, uh, the the core idea behind the publish with a purpose is understanding that the purpose has to be co-created between government and, and civil society. Um, it's not just what government decides to open, but in the discussion uh, about the purpose of the open data policy, understanding what the needs uh, and, and, and requests and challenges from civil society organizations are. Um, so the cornerstone, cornerstone of any open data policy that actually wants to create change is to get the conversation going with the, the civil society organizations, the possi possible reusers from the get-go uh, before even, uh, even understanding maybe what the problem is sit together understand what the core pro problem is between uh, between all the actors and then decide uh, what the what the publication plan is going to be uh, understanding also the challenges and the needs from government um, because opening up data is not easy uh, and so uh, the recommendation is to always get the conversation going from the start fantastic so I'm going to go to a few quick fire questions uh, we've, we've got in and then we'll, we'll, we'll try and round off in about 10 uh, or so minutes. Uh, we did have a very first question in uh, from John Dean uh, Marcunas, uh, particularly to Katie, where, where you referred to a uh, focus of your team on technology. Um, uh, and it's the obligatory blockchain question of have you been exploring or investing uh, in blockchain as part of your work on uh, uh, technology and transparency? There's Peter's answer on video with a thumbs down, but Katie, any, any, any Ours is a you? little bit like that too. Um, we, IDOC did publish a, a white paper. Uh, I can't remember the link, but if you look up IDRC blockchain, you can find it. It explores the uses of blockchain uh, for development in a variety of different arenas and avenues. Um, while we're interested in the technology and the efficiencies it can bring, and it, it might even be useful for digitization of some systems, um, we, uh, we've we sort of come to the conclusion that, that the broader based impacts that are sometimes attributed to blockchain uh, aren't necessarily showing up yet and so won't be investing any further um, other than that white paper for the time being. <laughs> We are, however, and this is the other obligatory, um, looking at artificial intelligence, which might have some interesting benefits uh, in terms of uh, being able to support the digitization of land records, but would, you'd have to proceed with caution. Fantastic. Uh, and I'm going to bring us back then to the real corruption connection here. We've got a question uh, again, actually from John Dean uh, Marcunas about the types of data sharing that are the best to fight corruption. Where should we, if our, if our goal is not open data on land, but is very, very specifically the fight against corruption and looking for the, the most important things to either open up or increase the sharing of, even if we're not talking full open data, but we, we recognize some information asymmetries around uh, land data that are, that, are, uh, that addressing those could be useful in the fight against corruption. Maybe I can come to each of you to say, where do you see the, the most important place to focus um, being? Uh, and I don't know, maybe, Natty, if I can come to you first. Yeah, I was just, uh, I just uh, sent the, the link to the year table on the open up guide on anti-corruption. So for the conversations that we've been having um, and, and working with, with Transparency International Mexico uh, in the implementation there, um, and, and then the uh, Organization for American States Program for uh, Combating, anti -corru Combating Corruption, um, these tend to be the 30 data sets that make more sense in, in getting this conversation going. So you have, uh, you have land registration and the tax records and asset declarations, uh, public procurement, of course, um, and, uh, and meeting records. It, this seems to be the, the, the data that, 
that um, actually has con we have consensus around that should be this, the beginning of this of this policy. But fighting corruption is is uh, is more complicated than just opening up data. So these are the the three the 30 data sets that that we um, collected for the open up guide but then as i said in any of the countries we need to understand its own uh, corruption uh, system and anti-corruption system to tackle uh, what the key data sets would be um so just going back to, to uh, yeah to a comment that i i couldn't i couldn't do because i was i was uh, going offline sorry um as far as what what can uh, land what the incentive could be about uh, publishing land land uh, registers for countries that are trying to combat corruption um, in collaboration, um, maybe understanding if there's actually purchases of land done by dirty land, by dirty money uh, could, could be a mixed up of actually this information with other kind of information and we could actually understand how uh, corruption organizations are actually working cross-cutting between uh, the, the limits of each of the countries. So um, I, I do believe that there's there's actually added value. This is just a super, hyper duper simple ex example, uh, but I do think there's that it makes sense that the land registry is part of the key data sets to combat corruption. Peter, are there specific information asymmetries maybe more detailed than the land registers you think we, we should be attacking first? Yeah, I mean, for me, um, if the government is not interested and incentivized to share information or is not able to, then it strikes me that it has to be an advocacy play. And therefore, uh, I would say that the, the two quickest ways that you do that are by using um, drones and satellite imagery um, and sort of half joking, go around to all the local surveyors and pay, pay them for their uh, surveys that they hold privately, by the way because all of the valuable transactions sit with the surveyors um, and it, their data belongs to them under copyright uh, typically. So I would, I would say that you, know, you have to use those tools to get at it. I think that if the government is potentially willing to begin to share its data, if it has decent data, then it cannot just be a dialogue between civil society and governments. And I, and I keep hearing the references civil society and government, civil society and governments. And that strikes me as an advocacy play, which is fine and it's great and it has its place. But if you're going to really get change, you have got to engage commercial sector and provide data that can be used for innovation and building opportunities on top, because otherwise, why would people do it? They'll simply hide in the shadows for their own per personal benefit. It's very different when you have a thousand startups and a bunch of major investors and others saying, you know, we can build businesses on top of Her Majesty's Land Register if you lower the price and access to that data set. And it's not just about who's the beneficial owner of an offshore trust that owns half of London, right? It's because I'm land insight and I can build a business on top of it. Yeah. So maybe to pick up from there, one of the questions coming up also is around the legal frameworks needed to protect vulnerable groups. So if we recognize there's the need for the private sector to be thoroughly part of the process of opening up, but we also recognize not only then the information asymmetries, but the power asymmetries that were illustrated in some of those cases we've touched on. Um, Katie, are you seeing anything from the work OD for these engaged with about the kind of legal frameworks or protections that are needed? Uh, and I might put that to others as, as well in a moment. Um, yes, I mean, I, I think the, the land sector in particular, I, I think it's quite complex and there's a, a number of different legal frameworks, but we're definitely sort of um, the, the broader network and, and my team's sort of broader mandate is, is very much engaged around digital rights and human rights frameworks, as well as regu regulatory, working with regulatory bodies. I think we need to be cautious um, as we release more information that Peter, some of those discussions you were just bringing up around the potential harms um, uh, and particularly to vulnerable groups, um, that, that those are brought into consideration. And that does mean um, that you have to be cautious when sharing data and there needs to be some, some good foresight around, particularly around personal data, but even beyond that, I mean, I, I, in terms of legal frameworks, and I've already mentioned data trusts, which are a, a legal um, 
they're, they're a legal mechanism. They're, they're relatively untested in the global south. They're, they're being proposed right now um, as, a, as a potential mechanism that could actually include corporations in terms of sharing their data. Um, and they're overseen, I mean, there's a few different models of them in which they're overseen by a, a board of trustees. Uh, and the trustees essentially determine who is able to access the data. And they also have legal recourse um, <clears throat> based on the use of that data. So they're able to risk in access. So they're based on, on a financial trust model. Essentially. And like I said, there, there's a few different models. So, so there's other versions of that. But anyways, that's the basic. Um, so those are, are being um, pitched as a potential opportunity for data sharing uh, along a particular end. It could be anti-corruption or to hold data in trust around a particular issue land registries. Um, like I said, they're relatively untested. There's not that many examples yet. So we're not totally sure, but it's definitely an area that people are exploring. Like, what are the legal options for um, yeah. protection, social protection? And, and it's going to become a more and more essential question, I think, over the next few years, um, given, uh, you know, GDPR, um, given that other countries are now, you know, looking at GDPR as a model um, or, or developing their own data protection schemes um, and, and how that is also fitting into other regulatory agencies and, and their approaches. So it'll be a really interesting, I think, and a lot of evolution um, in terms of how data shared and governed in the next sort of five to 10 years. Um, but I think there's still, our hope is still that we see that Sort of underlying openness where possible, you know, where it makes sense, um, where, you know, the data is relatively low risk. So we're sharing that data and Natty's point that we're being able to publish yep. with purpose um, and, and that we're very much working with governments to publish not just government data for government, but data that it ha is you has utility and is interesting both to corporations, to civil society groups, and potentially even to individuals who are looking to do kinds of analysis. And I think we need to start making those cases better as the yeah. open data community. Um, and that's part of the problem is that we haven't necessarily fully articulated those aspects or those cases, and we need to start doing more of that um, in order to, to really start to, to make inroads with some of those um, various disparate communities. Fantastic. And we've got a few last minute questions coming in. One I'll just address directly from uh, Selena around how we're classifying openness, whether we're talking intra organizational or to the public at large. I think in our discussion, we've been using openness to refer to data that is accessible to the public at large, but also talking about maybe places where data should be shared rather than for the open. So I think uh, Katie was pointing there to the way in which the open data community has matured over the last decade from maybe a binary, stuff is open, everyone can have it, or it's closed, no one can have it, to much more a recognition of a data spectrum where sometimes accessibility to the public is what's needed, sometimes greater sharing into organization is what's needed, and sometimes very strong protection of data um, is required. Um, then Gabriela, Mercedes, Gabriela Macedo's uh, put in uh, a question that picks up though on that, that legal protection theme, uh, reflecting on the way in which some big companies might be investing in studies to get information about the best place to buy land, um, considering conflicts, for example, um, uh, seeing the potential there for data to enable increasing speculation. Uh, and, and Gabriella puts the question, do we first need specific laws to regulate the action, maybe the speculation, before we go down the opening uh, data route? So I don't know, Peter or Natty, if you've got any thoughts on like, where should we be pursuing open data until laws are in place? Are there particular laws we need to be pursuing as part of our advocacy? Yeah, well, I, I think trying to, um, I think it's a terrible idea to try and block a, a market when you don't know where the market's going to go. There's always going to be speculation, and I, I think it's a lost cause. There are usually many good laws on the books, in fact, in many countries already that allow safeguards against um, these actions. They, uh, it's usually a question of poor institutions and a lack of enforcement. So I, I wouldn't jump to conclusions that necessarily laws are needed. I would also say I think that um, things like GDPR uh, are things that can and should be bolted onto. There's already an advancing dialogue around the ethics of data and the use. 
um, this idea and notion of Bill of Rights, which our Luminate group has been looking at, spending a lot of time and money on. And, and we shouldn't, uh, as a niche of open data, just try and create our own set of um, standards. We can very much bolt, bolt onto those. I would also use, I think, Adha in India as another good example around something called a consent-based architecture for uh, publicly collected data that is an individual in nature and is allowed to be shared through a consent in architecture called the India stack and what that enables um, where people have a, have a choice uh, in saying how their data can be used. And just to point out that in US counties, by the way, I can find out exactly what my neighbors pay for in tax. I can find out what the value of the property is and, and how much in, uh, tax they pay on it. And that's seen as a very good thing. <laughs> that's a very good use of open data uh, in terms of democratic norms. I'm not sure everyone would feel the same way. Yeah. So we've got just a few minutes left. So what I'm going to do is come around each of our panelists uh, um, and ask for their reflections on this opening theme we have of, of what ways can uh, there be support to move forward in this space. So it's clear that there's, uh, there is some potential here. There are some major challenges. We need to be very focused in the problems we address. We need to make sure we're really engaging the full range of stakeholders, public sector, private sector, civil society, um, that we're aligning incentives and that we're being clear when we're doing advocacy for the long game or when we're looking for those, those lower hanging fruits where things can move forward. Um, maybe if I can ask each of you just to reflect if, if, if you were able to say that the, the, the actions you think should be taken um, uh, to support work in this area. I know on our call we've got people who are uh, involved in policy, people from civil society, uh, a number of people involved in funding work. Where are the actions you'd like people to, to really explore? Uh, and if I come to uh, Natty first. Yes, thanks. Um, well, building up on, on, what, on what you said, I think, and, and what Peter said, um, having clear incentives for each of the, of the actors within the, the community is important. I do agree with Peter that, that, um, that not only civil society, as, 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 as I said, should be involved here. We need to create incentives for everybody involved, both government, private sector, and, and civil society. I do believe that there's a there's a, a good um, a good idea in involving the global conversations and and platforms that already exist, like the Open Government Partnership. Um, there there seem to be uh, that it seems to be a good platform to bring uh, together the conversation between all the actors and actually trying to create a commitment. Uh, for two years, which then you can held accountable, uh, you can be held accountable for. Um, so as far as having at least uh, small commitments and going um, step by step, I do believe that global conversations are are a way to to move forward with any of the of the open data thematic priorities. Um, and I do believe that there's there is something to be learned um, out of this. Uh, the, the, the experience that we've had with, with this uh, open up guide on anti-corruption for the hemispheric program, actually being super blunt and direct on what is being asked for uh, governments to do. Um, so having the guide building up as a framework for the conversation for 33 countries uh, all together actually made sense. Um, so, so having a clear, a clear call, a clear, clear request, um, it, it's not that uh, there, there aren't any, any more data sets that should be open, but just to get the conversation going, having a clear uh, request, it actually made perfect sense and allowed the conversation and the negotiations between these 33 countries to actually move forward uh, rather quick. So using some of those global processes and regional processes to move stuff forward. Katie, what, 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 what's, what's next for you? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of what Nati articulated, I would agree with all of that. Um, I would also build on uh, the need to do more local collaboration. Like, I think so much of this, of what we're discussing, really looks different in the different contexts. Um, so as well as engaging with these global processes, looking at, at local change makers and local drivers of change. Um, and that might mean engaging more with the media or working with media to do data-focused advocacy 
that could include working with um, uh, local stakeholders like local companies, as well as, of course, engaging with government and, and encouraging them where there's possible, where it's possible if they're part of the OGP, for example, I totally agree with Nadi, per to consider pursuing um, a commitment uh, to release their land data. But I also think it will involve doing more sort of active research, like sometimes it just involves um, supporting different kinds of case studies or uh, building evidence around the use and utility. And I mean, I think sometimes that's why we're on shaky ground is the more we have evidence of people trying and using and, and creating change with these processes, the more there is to hook on to in terms of advocating or asking for that data to be released in the future. So the more we can support some of those case studies and, and some of that activity, I mean, I. I uh, for different communities that are different levels of maturity in terms of using open data, but um, for being able to access and use open data, but the more uh, we can sort of follow and learn from the more mature communities. I think there's new learning to be had, obviously, but there's a lot of space to potentially garner new uh, interest and new investment um, by taking that approach um, and by proposing new new ideas to at least start to pilot. I think Peter's um, point that, that uh, perfection is the enemy of the good is an excellent one that sometimes you just have to sort of roll up your sleeves and say, well, what can we do? Will this be successful or not? And sometimes it won't work, but at least trying to, to pilot some of these initiatives and, and do some sort of action research and, and capture that and be able to share it back either regionally, locally, yeah. regionally, or globally is super powerful. Particularly striking there, starting with building on some of the media examples as well, the ones that came out in our online debate of where where, where there has been use of data that's having an impact and so building on some of those things and, and, and doing that research and experimentation you describe offers us some ways forward. Uh, Peter, closing thoughts, where, where are the ways forward for you? Yeah, well, both Katie and Natty make excellent points, um, so I to double click on, on all of those. I, I had four ideas that I, that I sort of put down. Um, despite all my bumbling around the field for so long, I'm not sure still what good looks like. Um, I think it would be helpful if uh, somebody, I don't know who, came up with what does good look like. Um, the second one is um, there's a real lack of exchange between government uh, organizations that deal with land. Um, you know, if you look at financial regulators, they have very well advanced both in the south, south to south, south to north, um, or, you know, around financial regulation, even even around uh, other areas, education standards, health standards. It doesn't exist in land. There is no international organization of land registers, for example, or ministers of land. And I think that's a big hole because you don't exchange what is, you know, what works, what why did it work? What didn't work, um, etc. And I think there's a lot of value that could be could be put there. Um, I think an interesting angle for advocacy around land is on supply chain. Um, I think as we see more and more people care about where stuff comes from, where is it made, how is it made, uh, and a lot of it has to come from somewhere on the Earth's surface or on the on the maritime surface. And so um, it's often those people buying leases for oil palm plantations or extractive purposes and others. And I think that's uh, if government is not reactive to pressure, certainly I think uh, some of the supply chain has been work in that area. But I think there could be more. And then I think new corporate models for government, government where government, it's one thing to bash away to government for not having or opening up land. But if they're not really able to do it, and the models of financing them have proven not to work, uh, then it's sort of it's like flogging a dead horse. You know, you're not going to get forward. Um, so, are there new cooperative models where private sector can work with governments to help build those data sets that can benefit people? And I think there are you know new examples. Um, Stefan Verholtz at GovLab in New York talks about data collaboratives and civic trusts. Um, which I know Katie mentioned, I think there's some interesting concepts that could be explored there, which are sort of new to the land field, but I certainly think could offer some real solution on how you get more official data in place. Fantastic. Well, 
it only is left for me to say thank you to all our panelists who've given us a, a real tour through some of the uh, opportunities, some of the challenges, nuances, and ways forward for exploring open data land and anti-corruption. Uh, as I said, this is stage two of a three-part process, so I'd really encourage people on landportal.info to find the uh, write-up of our last dialogue. I believe there'll be some sort of uh, write-up and recording of this discussion, and that will feed into to further discussions, as this is a theme that I, I, I know our colleagues at Land Portal have really been seeking to keep uh, uh, the dialogue moving forward on and, and seek to support action uh, uh, on um, advancing the, the kind of targeted focused action that can help us uh, address corruption problems in land and, and really realize uh, a more secure tenure for, 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 for more people uh, to support the, the development journey. So thank you to all our panelists. Thank you to everyone who's putting questions. Uh, uh, to Neil, who behind the scenes has, has, has kept us uh, running. Uh, and uh, we will end our webinar there. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, and there's a brief survey you'll now be getting, I think, uh, at the end of the webinar, uh, participants uh, to uh, respond to. So please do take a, take a response to that. Thank you.